you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to this presentation instead of just heading off to the beach. My name is Joana Antunes. I'm actually Portuguese. I did my undergrad in the University of Lisbon, IST, with Professor Luis Reis over there. So if I say any silly things, you can blame him for that. <laughs> now I'm pursuing my NGD or a PhD with the universities of Cranfield, Exeter, and Warwick in the UK, working for one of the leading aircraft manufacturers. So the project I'll be talking about today is about trying to enhance the fatigue strength in life of aircraft fuselage using a treatment called laser pinning. So as some of you may know, an aircraft fuselage is joined together by thousands up to millions of rivets. And these rivets are made of aluminium, so they're very light in weight. However, if we add them all up, that will contribute to a significant uh, portion of the weight of the aircraft. So, and this is, oh, and oh, we also know that um, mechanically fastened joints like rivets are well known for having poor fatigue properties due to severe stress concentrations and secondary bending. So because of this, um, these aircraft companies looking into using friction steel welding as an alternative to the riveted joints. And friction steel welding has plenty of advantages, one of which the fact that it uses no filler material, which is again important for um, weight considerations in the fuselage. However, if friction steel welding has these advantages, the question you might be asking is why hasn't it been implemented into the industry yet? And the reason for this is that friction steel welding has three main challenges. First of all, it produces soft and heat affected zones due to the heat input of the process. It also creates a distribution of defects called lack of penetration defects that I'll talk about um, in a bit. And lastly, but probably most importantly, um, the joint will be exposed to tensile residual stresses that I'll be showing later as well. So all these reasons will contribute to decrease the fatigue life of the joint. So to combat this, um, we're looking at using this treatment called laser pinning uh, to try to increase the life of the joint. Laser pinning is a well-known surface treatment, usually compared to shot pinning, but laser pinning is usually associated with deeper compressive residual stresses. Some of you might still be wondering how it works and how does it um, create regions of compressive residual stresses. Basically, when the laser hits the surface of the metal, it creates a plasma. This will create a shock wave, which will propagate through the metal. And as this wave propagates, it will plastically deform the material, and the material that surrounds it needs to adapt. And it's this adaptation, or the pushback of the material, that creates regions of compressive residual stresses that will hopefully improve the fatigue life of these components. In terms of parameters and layout of the pinning, um, I'm afraid to say there's no one size fits all. Um, in the case of this project, after some parameter optimization, uh, I'm obviously not allowed to disclose the parameters, but I can show you the layout that we end up using. Um, can't see that well, but there's a light gray region, which is the weld, and then the pinned patch, basically covering all the width and length of the weld. So I'm gonna show you three main um, studies that I've been working on my PhD so far. So I'm gonna guide you through the residual stresses, also the fatigue tests that I've been working on, and finally an FE model that I've been developing to understand these residual stresses. So as far as residual stresses in the fatigue samples, just welded without any peening, we can see um, that the baseline stresses go up to 100, 130 megapascal. Most importantly, these are tensile residual stresses. So we can think that if we have a defect somewhere in that weld, that will be exposed to tensile residual stresses. After pinning, however, with the parameters and layouts uh, that we used, we were able to achieve quite significant compressive residual stresses, almost up to 200 megapascal compressive, which is quite significant for the thickness of this um, sheet of metal, which is only 2.3 millimeter thick. So we're getting um, compression almost up to half a millimeter on both sides because the pinning was done on both sides of the sample. So as far as fatigue tests go, I tested samples in different conditions, but for the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna be showing you three um, types of samples. First, I have aircraft reference, which is just pristine aluminum material with no welds. Then we have samples 
um, in as welded condition, and finally with lack of penetration defects. And a lack of penetration defect, um, if you hadn't figured out already, is basically the incomplete, incomplete bonding between the two plates. So if you're trying to get the two plates together and you have the rotating tool on top, you'll have the defects on the opposite side. And in this case, we have a target of 0.4 millimeter deep. Obviously, this is a target depth and not the real depth of the defect. So as you can see, if we compare just the pristine aluminum material with samples with welds, there is a reduction of about 70% of the fatigue life. And this is for the reasons that I talked about in the beginning, um, <coughs> such as the residual stresses and the softening effect and microstructure of the weld. Things get particularly interesting, however, when we add defects to these samples. So when we have a lack of penetration defect of a target depth of 400 microns, or 0.4 millimeter, we can see there's a reduction of about 90% of the fatigue life, which is quite substantial. And when we analyze the fracture surfaces of these samples, we can see that they fracture through the lack of penetration defect, which is telling us that the defect is acting as the dominant crack initiation location, and it's the main cause for that loss of life. Um, something particularly interesting about these results as well with the defects is that we were expecting that the cracks would initiate where the depth was the highest because the depth of the, well, the defect goes all throughout the weld. But this is not um, what we observed using scanning electron microscopy. It seems a bit random in terms of depth, so what we're trying to analyze if, is that if there is any influence of aspects like the shape factor of the crack, and maybe that's what's influencing initiation, and it's a work that I'll be working on in the future. <coughs> so <coughs> after thinning, um, we can see we were able to obtain an improvement up to a factor of two on the lowest um, load range. Um, obviously, as the load increase, the effect of the thinning isn't as obvious, but we can still see that the thinning treatment was robust, and it's increasing the fatigue life, Unfortunately, this is a work in progress, and I only have the results after pinning for as well the samples, but hopefully I will have the remaining um, samples soon. So finally, I just want to talk to you about the EPI model that I have been developing as well, actually in the start of my PhD. The objective of this model is essentially to try to figure out what is the ideal residual stress field that I'll want to obtain with the pinning that will lead me to the best fatigue life improvements. This is just to explain, I'm basically modeling um, my, my um, fatigue samples and modeling the defects as a notch that I can vary its depth. A very important and time consuming bit of this part of the work was actually to apply the residual stresses into the EPI model. If you ever tried to do this, you'd know that when you try to input a residual stress field into Abacus or any EPI model um, software for that matter, um, the balance stress will be different from the initial target stress because the EPI model or the EPI code is basically trying to find the equilibrium condition. So I had to create um, basically a PI controller into Python that compares the balance stress with the target stress that I'm trying to input. And if those two are different, it creates a corrected um, residual stress field and incrementally applies it until those two stresses are equal. This is work in progress as well, but you can clearly see that I have a case with no residual stress field being applied and then three different stress fields where I'm just varying the peak compressive stress from 100 to 300 megapascal compressive. And we can see obviously the K max is decreasing as the peak stress increases. And we're coming to the uh, final remarks on this presentation. If you take anything out of this is that the failure on a friction steel welded joint will be basically a competition, and competition is the key word here, between three main factors. The stress intensity factor at the defect tip, obviously, the microstructure of the welded material, as well as the residual stresses that come not only from the thinning treatment itself, but also the baseline ones coming from just the residuals, um, the weld residual stresses. And that's about it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. And if not, and if you want to just talk about pinning or friction steel welding anytime, just email me at that uh, contact. Thank you very much. Thank you.